Heavenly Father, as we continue on in our study, we once again ask that you would guide and direct, send your spirit and your angels to uh, be with us here in this meeting place, and let uh, these truths be presented in a way that's easy to understand, and uh, that in such a way that it might impact us individually. Um, Lord, we want to be part of finishing this work. We want this part of your vineyard to be impacted by this final warning message. We pray that uh, these meetings can be a launching pad for finishing the work in this part of the vineyard. And those that are represented here, we ask that you'd put a burden upon their hearts to test the things that they're hearing. And if they're true, bring them into their experience, their life, and their understanding. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're finishing off the complete vision, and we'll move right into power, seat, and authority. Um, or we're finishing off the subject of the vision. There are two visions, two words translated vision, that run through Daniel's writing. And once you bring them into um, an understanding for yourself, you see that these visions also run throughout the scriptures. Um, in, on page 80... Uh, the, we were just at the snapshot vision being the vision by the Hittico uh, River. Underneath that, the foundational question. When the question is asked, how long should be the vision of the daily and the transgression of desolation? Uh, that is the complete vision of Daniel 8. Um, and the subject of the complete vision is the two desolating powers of paganism and papalism. These Two powers are represented in a variety of ways in the scriptures, or in, in the book of Daniel and in the scriptures. Um, the action of this question, by action I mean what do these two powers do? They trample down the sanctuary and God's people. These are characteristics, of course, of Rome and the papacy. Now, the vision of the Uli is the vision of Daniel 8. This is where the complete vision is given. Um, and you can see this here. In Daniel 8, 1 and 2. And Daniel's told to shut up the complete vision. And uh, verses 26 and 27. And then in chapter 9, verses 21 to 23, this is when Gabriel comes and gives him understanding of the complete vision. The vision of the trampling down. This is a truth that uh, we haven't understood as Adventism. I'm, I'm certain of that. Um, you can't, once you begin to look at the 1843 chart and remind yourself that Sister White says this was directed by the hand of the Lord, and you realize that the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation, is portraying two desolating powers paganism, papalism. And, and sometimes maybe, maybe it seems a little bit confusing when we're talking about pagan Rome. Paganism, the daily paganism, represents. The entire history of paganism's trampling down. Babylon, Medes and the Persians, Greece, pagan Rome. Paganism, the daily, the daily represents paganism in a general sense. But there are many passages in Daniel and Revelation where it's dealing with pagan Rome. So at that point, the daily is representing pagan Rome in a specific sense. So it, it, there's a little variable on, on the daily. Is it representing here Paganism gen in general, or is it talking about pagan Rome at this point? Because it does, it does play out both those ways. But it's the same with, it's the same with papalism. We don't, we don't think much about it, but in Daniel 8, the papacy is symbolized as the transgression of desolation. But in Daniel 11 and Daniel 12, the papacy is symbolized by the abomination of desolation. What's the difference between the transgression and the abomination of desolation? They both represent papalism. It's, it's just describing two aspects of papalism. So the fact that the daily has you know, two manifestations, paganism in general, all those powers, or pagan Rome specifically, it's not a contradiction. It's, it's just add light. By the way, 
the pioneers understood that the transgression of desolation in Daniel 8 was identifying the combination of church and state that took place. That's, that's the action that empowered the papacy when Clovis and the other seven European kings brought their countries into a church straight relationship with the papacy. That was the principle that was transgressed, the combination of church and state. So when the papacy is symbolized by the transgression of desolation, it is emphasizing the combination of church and state. But when it's talking about the abomination of desolation, also symbolizing the papacy, abomination is a word that is associated with idolatry. So in the book of Daniel, you have the papacy symbolized both as the transgression of desolation and the abomination of desolation. The transgression is emphasizing the combination of church and state. Abomination emphasizing the, the, the idolatrous aspect of the papacy. In the book of Revelation, which is the same book as Daniel, you see both of these, both of these truths represented. The image of the beast is emphasizing the combination of church and state. That's the only definition of the image of the beast. Sister White says it in a variety of ways. She says when secular power is used to enforce or sustain religious decrees or dogma, this is an image of the beast. The image of the beast in the book of Revelation is emphasizing the combination of church and state, and the mark of the beast is identifying the mark of Rome's authority, which is the idol Sabbath. The mark of the beast is emphasizing the idolatry of Rome. The image of the beast is emphasizing the way that Rome operates. So the image of the beast and the mark of the beast in the book of Revelation is the transgression of desolation and the abomination of desolation in the book of Daniel. They, they correspond to one another. They're emphasizing two different aspects. So, so when you see that Daniel always portrays Rome in two aspects, portrays Rome as two desolating powers and describes the desolation that is accomplished by these two powers as trampling down the sanctuary and the host. Then when you come to the 2520 and you, you make a correction of William Miller's understanding and the, the 2520 did not start when Judah was carried away in captivity but it started when um, Israel, the northern kingdom, was carried away into captivity and the 2520 being the, the, the time period that Israel was going to be punished for breaking the covenant, and you find this time prophecy in Leviticus 26. It's mentioned four times in Leviticus 26. Then you see that the, the punishment, the curse, called the curse of Moses, Daniel in Daniel 9 calls it the curse of Moses. Other writers in the Bible call it the curse of Moses. The punishment for Israel breaking the covenant is that they were, God was going to bring indignation against them for 2,520 years, and it began in 723, and it ends in 1798. And the first half uh, concludes in the year 538, and the first half is emphasizing the time period that literal Israel and the literal sanctuary was trampled down by the pagan powers, and the second half is emphasizing when the spiritual holy city was trampled down by papalism. And you can find that in Revelation 11, verses 2 and 3. So suddenly you see that the 2520 is also identifying these two phases of, of Rome, or the daily, the abomination of desolation. And suddenly this chart, this time prophecy, has a bearing here at the end of the world because, brothers and sisters, when you begin to look closely at the prophetic understanding of Adventism on the relationship between pagan Rome and the papacy, how pagan Rome placed the papacy on the throne of the earth, you suddenly realize that you're finding the, the definition of how the United States is going to place the papacy on the throne of the earth at the end of the world. That's why it's important, because that's, that's what's going on in Daniel 11, verses 40 to 45. There was a secret alliance formed, before Ronald, formed by Ronald Reagan and the papacy in the Ronald Reagan years to bring down the King of the South and the work of the United States to place the papacy on the throne of the earth was underway and the work that the United States is doing has been prefigured by pagan Rome's work to place the papacy on the throne of the earth in 538. But if you somehow can eliminate the understanding of Rome from the, from the minds of Seventh-day Adventists, then their ability to be clear about what's going on with the United States the Islam and the United Nations and the papacy right now has been removed, has been removed. That's why in verse 14 of Daniel 11 it says, Rome establishes the vision. 
That's why we've changed our understanding of the daily in another direction, turned it totally upside down. So um, there are other notes here on the vision uh, that you can look over at your own leisure in terms of this vision is, is addressed in Habakkuk and, um, Habakkuk and Ezekiel and in the passages of those writers that Sister White so tells us was, uh, was scriptures that the Millerites found comfort in in their time period. And I would suggest to you that those passages will have uh, relevance for us here at the end as well um, because Habakkuk is saying, write the vision and make it plain. And this word vision is the complete vision. At the end of the world, brothers and sisters, God's people are to understand um, this vision that is the portrayal uh, of, of the, the whole history of the 2520. That history contains um, truths that we must understand. The, the, the 2520 is when God's people were scattered, when they were trampled down, when that time period was ov over, um, God once again stretched out his hand to gather himself a people. Um, the time of the Gentiles concludes, and in 1844, God for the second time in history is going to raise up a people unto himself, modern Israel. The only other time he did it was ancient Israel. At Mount Sinai, ancient Israel entered into a covenant with the Lord. They were married to the Lord. They received the law. Um, and if you don't think they were married to the Lord at Sinai, then then you've forgotten that God divorced Israel at the stoning of Stephen. And you have to be married to divorce someone, and that's what took place. Um, and so when you come to the parable of the ten virgins being fulfilled in the Millerite time period, which is the call to the marriage, you realize that for the second time in history, on October 22, 1844, God was going to marry a people. They were going to receive his law and they were going to enter into covenant with him. God raised up a denominated people October 22nd, 1844, and this, this raising up of a people in Scripture is always portrayed as happening after the scattering. The scattering comes first. So when you go to early writings, page 74, you find the chapter titled The Gathering. The first paragraph, Sister White's talking about the scattering, and the second paragraph she goes right into saying, that I seen, or it's in the first paragraph after she talks about this, par after the scattering, she goes right into endorsing this chart. And the second paragraph, she tells us that, hey, the pioneers were right on the daily. That chapter, dealing with the scattering, the daily, and this chart, is identifying the importance of understanding the relationship between the 1260 years when God's people were scattered and the time period when God stretched out his hand again to gather a people together and make a denominated people. All right? it's all, and, that, and the history of the, the daily, the time prophecy of the 1335 that starts at the daily and brings you to 1843, that needs to be intelligently understood at the end of the world because there was a blessing to come to 1843. It says, blessed is he who cometh to the 1335 days. What was the blessing to come to 1843? Sister White has a, a statement where she says, blessed are the eyes that saw what transpired in 1843 and 1844. And what did those Millerites see in 1843 or 1844? They saw their way into the most holy place, into the marriage. There was a blessing. The 1335-year thir prophecy that began in 508 when the daily was removed <coughs> was nothing more than the, the time prophecy that identified when the marriage was going to take place and if you arrived at that point in history with your head on straight, a wise virgin, not a foolish virgin, then you were going to be blessed because you were entering into the marriage. But here at the end of the world, most Seventh-day Adventists that have anything to say about the 1,335 days say, oh, it's 1,335 literal days at the end of the world, which is a bunch of foolishness. Because if you move that 1,335 days to some place where it doesn't come to a conclusion in 1843, you've destroyed the ability to demonstrate the call to the marriage in 1844. You know, if, if, you don't, if you don't know when the marriage took place, you don't go to the marriage. You don't know when and where it's going to be. Um, so anyway, these things are illustrated on this chart, which Sister White says was directed by the hand of the Lord. And she says it in the very chapter where she's dealing with the scattering and the gathering. These things we need to understand. Um, in page... Um, 82, uh, 
when Sister White deals with Habakkuk, she ties it in with the parable of the ten virgins. Um, page 83. The great rivers of Shinar, the Holy Spirit has so shaped matters both in the giving of the prophecy and in the events portrayed as to teach that the human agent is to be kept out of sight, hid in Christ, and that the Lord God of heaven and his law are to be exalted. Read the book of Daniel. Call up, point by point, the history of the kingdoms there represented. Behold, statesmen, councils, powerful armies, and see how God wrought to abase the pride of men and lay human glory in the dust. The light that Daniel received from God was given especially for these last days. The great vis the visions he saw by the banks of the Uli and Hittical, the great rivers of Shinar, are now in the process of fulfillment, and all the events foretold will soon come to pass. The, the Uli is the vision of Daniel 8. And uh, virtually all the events of Daniel 8 have already been fulfilled, except primarily Daniel 8, 14. There's still a work going on in the most holy place, the vision of the Uli. The vision of the Hittical is the vision of how the king of the north comes to his end and human probation closes in Daniel 12, 1, when Michael stands up. It's the, the vision of the events. That... Uh, so in, in the Uli River, you have the, the events that are still going to come to pass, the work that Christ is doing in the most holy place, and the vision of the Hittical, you have the message of the events that lead to the close of human probation. But uh, the understanding of the events is given to Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, and the understanding of the experience of the most holy place is given to him in Daniel chapter 10. Inspiration purposely ties these two visions together in a variety of ways. In a variety of ways. Um, in, uh, on page 84, when Sister White said in that quote, consider the circumstances, um, on pa bottom of page 83, we see the quote from Revelation 10 where John takes a little book, it's sweet in his mouth, bitter in his stomach. Sometimes we don't realize, we don't think about the fact that prophets convey information in at least two ways, probably many more than two, but two primary ways. The information that they record of the vision or the dream, the prediction, is one theme of information. But another theme of information that prof prophets convey is in how they, they act out or enter into the vision itself. When John is eating the little book and it's sweet in his mouth and bitter in his stomach, he's illustrating Adventism. Um, it, it's a, an illustration that's being portrayed by the prophet itself. And that's done s several times in Scripture. On page 84, the top, you have Zechariah 3. And this is one of several quotes where Sister White is telling us in Zechariah chapter 3 that Joshua and the angel is um, referring to the work of Christ, uh, the very last work of Christ in the Day of Atonement. Joshua representing the people of God. Um, the angel is Christ, the high priest. And so in, it, it's easy to show from the writings of Sister White that Zechariah chapter 3 is identifying the end of the world. And then you go into, into chapter 4, a man that is wakened. In chapter 4, immediately after chapter 3, which we know is the end of the world, it says this, And, and the angel that talked with me again, me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his, lamp, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side of the bowl. The left side thereof. What is it that he sees when he wakes up? What is that? The, the, the seven branch candlestick in the sanctuary, correct? Now, Zechariah is a prophet during the time period that they're doing what? They're rebuilding Jerusalem and the sanctuary. So he's a prophet that's living when they're building the sanctuary all over again, right? So he, he's going to understand the furnishing that goes in the sanctuary, correct? And what happens after he sees this? He says, So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? How is it that Zechariah can't know what the seven-branch candlestick in the holy place is? How can a prophet not know that, let alone a prophet 
during the time period that the sanctuary is being rebuilt. rebuilt. How, how can t so what's, it, what's the next statement say? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest not what these be? It's being emphasized for the reader. Zechariah says, I don't know what they are. And then instead of the angel answering what they are, immediately he says, you don't know what they are? Why is he saying that? Who's, who's Zechariah representing here? He's representing God's people. Was there a time when God's people woke up and had to come to understand with what the sanctuary was? 1844, October 22nd, 1844, the Millerite movement did not understand the sanctuary. This is a parallel to John's bitter stomach. Because John is told, go measure the sanctuary right after he has this bitter stomach experience. This is just another illustration of the Millerites, after the great disappointment, having to come to understand the sanctuary. So prophets are used to illustrate God's people at the end of the world. Upon the testimony of two things established, we just gave you two, there are several others in Scripture. And I want to get that in place here because we want to emphasize a little bit later on that Daniel is also emphasizing God's people at the end of the world. Um, so let's move on. Put those, we put those concepts in place. Let's move on to power, seat, and authority. And we've already done some of this as well previously. Um, we're suggesting that it is Rome that establishes the vision. And in Revelation 13, 2, it says the dragon gave the papacy. We know that verse 2 is identifying the papacy, the composite beast. The dragon gave the papacy its power, seat, and great authority. We dealt with that yesterday. Uh, and generally in Adventism, we're not too familiar any longer with what that history is represented. Pagan Rome is the dragon. You'll see under that quote, Sister White is commenting on Revelation 12. She says, the dragon in Revelation 12 is Satan, but in a secondary sense, it is pagan Rome. Um, pagan Rome gave its seat of authority to the papacy in the year 330, when Constantine moved the capital of the empire from the city of Rome to the city of Constantinople, leaving the Roman church as the, the primary influence in that place. In fact, there are different themes of prophetic truth that you know, run simultaneously. And if you want to ever ask yourself, when was it that the papacy actually becomes the king of the north, I think you can make an argument right here. Because the, dra the seat of the dragon's authority moved from Babylon to Pergamos, then pagan Rome took it to the city of Rome. And when pagan Rome left the city of Rome and left it to, to the papacy, the papacy was then in control of the seat where the dragon power was. So this, this is probably where the papacy becomes the king of the north. But <coughs> in 496, Clovis began a process where the seven European kings, one by one, came into a church-state relationship with the papacy in order to remove the Hiroli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals. By the year 508, King Arthur came into the church-state relationship. The process was complete. Um, but the arrow here, that's an arrow, they continued to give their military power and support to the papacy after 508, all through the Dark Ages. So I'm, I'm not denying that. But the actual process of giving their power in that history is from 496 to 508. That's power. The authority they gave to the papacy, the civil authority, in the year 533, when Justinian identified the Pope of Rome as the corrector of heretics and the head of the churches. Now, they could not exercise this authority until they were placed in 538. But nevertheless, when Revelation 13.2 says that the dragon, pagan Rome's, the remnants of pagan Rome, gave their power, seat, and great authority to the papacy, these are the historical fulfillments of those actions um, that have been uh, understood by Adventism from the very beginning. The pioneers talk about this a great deal. Um, you'll see Great Controversy 55 there on page 86 where Sister White um, comments on this. And you'll see this summarization that I just put up on the board there as well. So the, the following references here are passages in Daniel and Revelation 
that deal with these histories, that deal with these histories. These histories are the, some of the primary subjects of Daniel and Revelation. The, one of the primary subjects of Daniel and Revelation is the relationship between pagan Rome and papal Rome, and the actions that describe this relationship between pagan Rome and papal Rome are this power, seat, and authority. So if you're not looking for it, you don't realize how many different passages in Daniel and Revelation are dealing with these histories. What I'm going to tell you about these histories, you can find in the book Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith. Check it out. Test what I'm saying. In Daniel 8, 11 through 14, um, we dealt with this yesterday. We agree with the pioneers. The pioneers were correct that uh, verse 11 is dealing with Pagan Rome, yea, he, pagan Rome, magnified himself against the prince of the host. The prince of the host is Christ. Pagan Rome magnified itself against Christ at, its, at his birth when he tried to kill him, and they put him on the cross. This is an agreement with Revelation 12. And by him, the word by, better translated through, through pagan Rome, paganism, the daily, was lifted up and exalted. They did this throughout their history as they incorporated all the different pagan religions religions unto their own religion and place them in the Pantheon Temple. The Pantheon Temple was in the city of Rome. So it says, and through pagan Rome, paganism was lifted up and exalted. This is room. And the place of pagan Rome's sanctuary, pagan Rome's sanctuary was in the city of Rome. It was the Pantheon Temple. The place of say, pagan Rome's temple, the city of Rome, was cast down by Constantine in the year 330. In this verse, therefore, is identifying when pagan Rome gave its seat to the papacy. Cast down. Uh, <clears throat> and a host within, in, I'm not getting into the, the uh, masculine feminine change that goes on in verses 9 through 12 at this time period, but in, in in the back, we have a book by John Peters, who's a theologian, that uh, his doctrinal thesis that he wrote in Andrews was on um, these verses in Daniel, Daniel 9 through 14. We have them available. Um, in verse 9 through 12, there's an oscillation that goes on. Verse 9, the little horn is pagan Rome, and in verse 9, the little horn is placed in a masculine sense. In verse 10, it's still the little horn that is the subject, but it's portrayed in the feminine sense. And that is the feminine of Rome is the papacy. In verse 11, it goes back to the masculine sense, pagan Rome. And in verse 12, it goes back to the feminine sense, the papacy. Now, if you don't know the Hebrew and you don't have a lexicon of these verses, it's very difficult to see the change between masculine and feminine, but they're there. Even the theologians that don't agree with John Peters will admit that they're there. But you can, you can see it if you want to. In verse 9, verse nine, the little horn is masculine. I mean, I don't know that you can see that. But you'll notice that in verse 10, the little horn, it's called it. When it refers to it, it's it. And in verse 11, it's he. And in verse 12, once again, it's it. So if you know what you're looking for, you can see that even the translators of the Bible were making a distinction between he and it as they went down through those verses. It goes from... Masculine, feminine, masculine, feminine. And in verse 9 and 11, the little horn is masculine. It's pagan Rome. And in verses 10 and 12, it's feminine. It's papal Rome. So we've just expressed the pioneer view that verse 11 is pagan Rome. And then verse 12 says this. And a host was given him, and that hymn's an added word by the translator. And a host was given the papacy against paganism by reason of transgression and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it pra practiced and prospered. This, is in the, this little horn here in verse 12 is in the feminine, although I know you can't see that easily, but we're not dealing with that right now. But what this verse is saying is a host, an army. Military power was given to the papacy. When was military power given to the papacy? From the years 496 to 508. And a host was given the papacy against the daily. This military power is going to attack or destroy the daily. Now, what daily was attacked or destroyed by the, military, the seven European kings? Well, it was the other three horns. They were paganism too. They, they may have been Aryans, but they were still pagans. And it was the, seven, the military might of the seven European kings 
that destroyed these other three pagan horns. And the way that this was carried out is by reason of transgression. And the transgression was the combination of church and state that took place by the, with these seven European kings and the papacy from the year 496 to 508. That's the transgression. And as, once it took place, the papacy cast the truth to the ground and it practiced and it prospered. Under time appointed, going to Rev Daniel 11, in verse 24, open your book, Daniel and Revelation, by Uriah Smith. When he's commenting on verse 24, he will tell you that verse 24 is still dealing with pagan Rome <coughs> in a time in Bible prophecy is a year. A year in Bible prophecy is 360 days. And this is, verse 24, is telling that pagan Rome would rule the world supremely for 360 years. And pagan Rome took control of the world when it conquered the third geographical obstacle. In Daniel 8 verse 9, the little horn was going to conquer the east, Syria, the south, Egypt, and the pleasant land, Israel. That was the three points of conquest that pagan Rome had to overcome to begin to rule the world supremely. It conquered Egypt, the third of those obstacles, in 31 BC. And for 360 years it ruled the world supremely until the year 330 when Constantine moved the capital from the city of Rome to Constantinople. What I'm hoping you'll see here is this passage relates to the story of the power, seat, and authority as well. It's identifying when the seat's given to the papacy. All right? Um, in verse Daniel 11, verses 30 to 31, we've been through this, but we haven't been through it from this perspective, so bear with me. Um, you see both those verses reflected there under intelligence, pollution, and taking away. At the end of verse 30, it says, Pagan Rome will have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. It's the papacy and Bible prophecy that forsakes the Holy Covenant. They are the, the falling away church in 2 Thessalonians. They are those that have forsaken the Holy Covenant. And at the end of verse 30, um, Pagan Rome has communications with them. They develop a dialogue. And any time anyone ends into a communication with the devil, they lose. And pagan Rome, from that point on, is no longer the subject of the prophecy, but the papacy is. So verse 31 is now dealing with the papacy, and it says, An arm shall stand on his part. His part, now the subject, is the papacy. What are the arms that came to the aid of the papacy? It's the power. The power that was given to the papacy from 496 to 508 and onwards. Military strength of the seven European kings are going to stand up for the papacy at the beginning of verse 31. And they're going to pollute the sanctuary of strength. This is identifying the warfare that took place as Roman Empire's crumbling and the point of conquest in those wars. When Attila the Hun and Genseric um, were attacking the Roman Empire, the, the object of their attack, what they were after, was the city of Rome. So in that warfare that ensued during those years, the city of Rome was conquered and destroyed and polluted. The, these arms of the seven European king were going to pollute the sanctuary of strength. The sanctuary of strength is um, the power of both pagan Rome and papal Rome. When, when pagan Rome was in the city of Rome, it ruled the world supremely for 360 years. As soon as it left the city of Rome, it ceased to rule the world supremely. Um, when, the pap when the Goths were driven out of the city of Rome in 508, the papacy ruled the world supremely until 1798 when the pope was taken out of the city of Rome. The city of Rome is the strength of pagan Rome and papal Rome. And during the warfare, after 330 until 538, the city of Rome was polluted. The seven European kings are also going to um, remove the daily. And it's in this history, 496 to 508, as the church-state relationship is coming together with the seven European kings and the papacy, that paganism is removed from each of those seven European nations' uh, constitutions. They change from a legal religion of paganism to Catholicism. And by 508, the religion of paganism has been legally removed from all seven of those nations. So they're going to take away. And this take away is, sir, it means remove. They're going to remove the religion of paganism as the legal religion from all seven of those kingdoms. So once again, this is the history when the power was given to papacy. So this is 
This is a corresponding passage to Revelation 13 too. That's what I'm going over here. And then it says these seven European kings, pagan Rome, will place the abomination that maketh desolate. Of course, that's 538. Daniel 12, 11 and 12. It says, and from the time the daily shall be taken away. This is sir, removed. The daily was taken away in 508. From the time the daily is taken away, 508. <clears throat> and the abomination of desolation, the papacy set up. When was the papacy set up? 538. There shall be 1290 years. This brings you to 1798. Here, this verse, brothers and sisters, is emphasizing a 30-year time period of the setting up of the papacy <coughs> between 508 and 538. However you need to define that and understand it, inspiration and history emphasize that there was a 30-year time period of preparation for the papacy to be empowered at this point. And when you look at the pattern of Christ, which is another study, you'll see that that the Antichrist power, brothers and sisters, the Antichrist power follows the pattern of Christ's time on earth perfectly. Christ was 30 years, um, al he was alive for 30 years before he was baptized and received power. The papacy, there was a 30 year preparation time period before the papacy was empowered. When Christ was empowered at his baptism, he then went out and gave his testimony for three and a half years. At the end of that three and a half years, he was crucified. When the papacy was empowered in the year 538, it went out and gave its satanic testimony for three and a half prophetic years, 1260 years. And at the end of the 1260 years, the papacy received a deadly wound just as Christ was put on the cross. Then Christ was resurrected, and then he ascended. What we're waiting for now, but it's just ahead, is that the papacy's deadly wound is going to be healed. He's going to be resurrected. And when that happens, he's going to ascend to the throne of the earth. Um, and, and there's more to that than, than that basic overview of that study. But the pattern of the Antichrist follows the pattern of Christ perfectly. And both the papacy and Christ were 30 years in preparation. Not an accident. One of the truths of the pattern of Christ is that when Christ came, he was changing from the old dispensation to the new dispensation, from the old covenant to the new covenant, from the earthly sanctuary to the heavenly sanctuary. There was a, a change in dispensations there. Sister White says John the Baptist was a connecting link between two dispensations. There was a, a change of dispensations that was taking place when Christ was here on earth. The focus of worship from God's people was changing from the earthly sanctuary to the heavenly sanctuary. That's one of the truths about Christ's time period here on earth. And this is one of the truths here of the Antichrist power. In this 30 years preparation, there was a change of dispensation of, of Satan's religion. It was changing from the, from the religion of paganism to papalism. Are they the same religion? Yes. But was the old covenant the same as the new covenant? Yes. There's, but there's some distinctions placed upon them, even though they're, they're the same. This is the change of dispensations between paganism to papalism, and it parallels perfectly the change of dispensation between earthly sanctuary, heavenly sanctuary. There's more to be said on that, but I want you to see that the pioneers' understanding of the daily being 508 and their understanding of the 1290 and the 1335 it, the argument that I just gave you, brothers and sisters, this is an argument that has been revealed in the past maybe four years. Okay, the pioneers didn't draw this parallel between the history of Christ and the history of the papacy and tie it in to the 1335 and the 1290. This is, this is new light, and I'm not trying to emphasize new light, but what I want you to understand is that the pioneers' understanding of 508 the 1290 and the 1335 was sound, and there are still arguments being brought forth by the Holy Spirit to defend their conclusions. And their conclusion is based on that from 496 to 508, the seven European kings removed the religion of paganism from their countries. That was the taking away of the daily. And of course, if you destroy that understanding, 
you're not only going to bring some understandings of the pioneers down to the dust, but you're going to eliminate your ability to see some of the new light that's coming at the end of the world. So um, back to Daniel 12, 11, and 12. Blessed is he that um, cometh to the 1335, which is the same starting point, which is 1443, or 1443, 1843. Sorry. In 1843, was there a, was there a change in dispensations going on in 1843 and 1844? A dispensation, let me define it for you, based on what I just shared with you about John the Baptist. From the holy to the most holy. There was a change in dispensation going on there. Good. So we, we understand that. All right. So I want to show you something. We started in our first presentation emphasizing that Jesus is the first and the last. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. And, and there are several ways that, that you can demonstrate that in God's word, he puts his signature in different truths by making the beginning of a divine thought correspond to an end of a divine thought. And on Friday night, and I know that those of you who are here, if you don't remember it, I don't hold it against you, but we pointed out that at the beginning of the 1260 years, you have a, a king leaving the city of Rome, 538, the king of the Goths, led the city of Rome. That's the beginning of the prophecy, and at the end of the prophecy, you have the pope, the king, leaving the city of Rome. Jesus, the beginning and the ending of that prophecy, there's God's signature. We pointed to the 2300-day prophecy. It begins on the third decree, which is followed by Nehemiah's fourth decree. And the 2300-day prophecy ends on the third message, and we're now waiting for the fourth message. There's more, to there's more than that. That's the basic overview. The beginning of the 2300-day prophecy corresponds to the end of the 2300-day prophecy. And this, one, this one's a, a mind blower. Why? Because you have one starting point for two prophecies that end at a different time. Can one starting point have a, a, a beginning that agrees with two different endings. So the question is this. The first time prophecy of the 1290 years, the emphasis of this time prophecy is the placing of the papacy on the throne of the earth. That's what it's about. It says, you know, from the time that the daily is removed and the abomination of maketh desolate set up. It's it's saying from this time period, it's saying the story of this time period is placing the papacy on the throne of the earth. So the 1290-year the prophecy, 1290-year prophecy, the beginning of it is emphasizing how the papacy gets placed on the throne of the earth. And when does it end? It ends when the papacy is taken from the throne of the earth. Okay? The beginning corresponds with the end. But we know also that in 508, there was a change in dispensations going on. The change from paganism to papalism. And when you start the 1335-day prophecy in 508, you have in that history a change of dispensations here at the beginning and a change of dispensations at the end. That's God's signature. And that's, that's amazing that he can start two prophecies at the same point and still have history at the beginning that corresponds to both the endings. Did I lose you on that one? That's outside of our little study here, but it's there, brothers and sisters. It's there. Jesus is the beginning and the ending. So if you go in, continuing on, if you go into the seven trumpets, the first four trumpets are the historical forces that brought down Western Rome. By the year 476, there was ne never an Italian king ruling the city of Rome. By the year 476, whatever remnants of the Roman Empire had been in the city of Rome were gone, and Western Rome was out of the history. And, and the providential forces that brought this about were the first four trumpets. The fifth trumpet is associated with Muhammad, and I believe Muhammad was born in 611, somewhere in there, seventh, beginning of the seventh century. He only lived a short period of time. But the pioneers correctly identify that the fifth trumpet is associated with Muhammad, and they also correctly identify that the reason that Muhammad was raised up was to chastise an apostate church. Muhammad was raised up to deal with the Catholic Church. That's what Islam's all about, and Islam has a specific role in Bible prophecy. So my point is this. 
the fifth trumpet is raised up to deal with the papacy. And the papacy came into power in 538. And shortly thereafter, here's Muhammad on the scene of history. So the, fourth, the first four trumpets are the history prior to the papacy. The, the following trumpets are the history after the papacy. And uh, so the first four trumpets are, are the history that's associated with, with this time period here. This time period here would include all of these. It's, a, it's nothing, not as specific as some of the other ones, but it's there. There are things that we can learn from that. But let's move on. The seed of Satan in the churches to Revelation. Um, the changeover from Pergamos to Thyatira. <coughs> Pergamos, still in, in the history here. Thyatira, symbolized by Jezebel, the papacy. So, um, in Pergamos... We're, it's pointed out that this is where Satan's seat is. What's Satan's seat? Well, it's the, this Chaldean religion that begins in Babylon, goes to Pergamos, and then pagan Rome gobbles it up and takes it to the city of Rome. So if you're really going to follow the story of Satan's seat in Pergamos, then it includes the story of the year 330, when Satan's seat in Rome was given to the papacy by pagan Rome. Um, it's, these are histories um, that, these are prophetic narratives that correspond to the histories identified in Revelation 13.2 of pagan Rome giving the power, seat, and authority to the papacy. Um, at the end of the world, the one that is seated upon the threefold um, alliance that we know as modern Babylon, the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, the one that is seated is the papacy. You can see in Revelation 17 all the different ways that it, she's illustrated as seating upon uh, the many waters, the scarlet beast, the seven mountains, uh, the king, she's reigning over the kings of the earth, which means she's seated upon the kings of the earth. Of, th of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, the papacy is the one that's si seating in the seat of, setting in the seat of authority, and that's why Sister White says, as we approach the last crisis, it is a vital moment that harmony and unity exist among the Lord's instrumentalities. The world is filled with, the st with storm and war and variance, yet under one head, it's all under one head, the papal power, the people will unite to oppose God in the person of his witnesses. The one that's in the driver's seat in the threefold union is the papacy. It's the one that is seated. Now, I didn't, I, I, if I would have been thinking ahead, I would have put power over here underneath the false prophet and authority under the dragon. So if you're looking at the board, don't, don't stumble over this. The dragon power is the civil power. It's the civil authority. It's the civil authority. What's the difference? A, clear, a good example of power and authority. Power is the, the military and economic strength of the United States. The United States is the false prophet. It's going to use its military and economic power to deceive, to force the whole world to accept the threefold union. The United States, the false prophet, is the power in the end of the world relationship. But authority is emphasizing civil authority. United Nations is the one world civil structure that is going to be used by the papacy, the United States, to enforce the mark of the beast. Um, so power, you have reference there. Um, the Ten Kings um, civil authority should be under the dragon power. Um, Daniel 8, we have went over that. We went over all of these. Trumpets, Revelation 2. How much time we have? 11 minutes. In the book that we have been recommending to you, This book, very good book. It, uh, he's a theologian, and you have to read, the, he writes like a theologian, but still, it's the very best book covering the history of the Millerite movement. It goes into the, the social conditions, the economic conditions that preceded uh, 1844, describes the arguments that went on as by the various groups that were getting involved in resisting the Millerites, and it describes what happens afterwards. And uh, after the Great Disappointment, one of the first things that happened is the Millerites that were going to maintain them the, the walk with the Lord that the, they were in had to come to grips with what went wrong with the prediction of William Miller. And he points out that the first, the first thing that they came across in inspiration that 
gave them conviction of who and what they were is the story of Elijah. Uh, they identif- they, the Millerites, before 1844, had recognized that they were a fulfillment of the parable of the ten virgins. They are, they are re- reviewing themselves as fulfilling the parable of the ten virgins before 1844. But after 1844, the thing that they were confronted with is that they were a fulfillment of Elijah. And so Elijah... It comes in two places in the scriptures. Keep this real simple because of time. You have Elijah the first, and you have Elijah the second. Who's Elijah the second? John the Baptist. And so when we're talking about Elijah here, we're in agreement with the foundational understanding that God's people at the end of the world are Elijah the third. One, you know, there's some people that say, well, Ellen White is the final Elijah. Some people say Adventism is the Elijah movement. But in any case... It's a standard understanding that Adventism is fulfilling Elijah III in one way or another. So, I agree with that personally. And uh, we're going to begin to look at the three Elijahs here. In Malachi, the last promise in the Old Testament is that before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, Elijah would come. And when Jesus was here, it was not the great and dreadful day of the Lord. The great and dreadful day of the Lord in prophecy is at the end of the world, the day of God's wrath. Before that day, Elijah was to come. And when Jesus was here, it was the great day of the Lord. And before the great day of the Lord, when Jesus was here, Elijah came as well. And that was John the Baptist. Christ said so. Elijah had to deal with a threefold enemy. Elijah's threefold enemy was Jezebel. Help me here. Bel, B-E-L. Um, Ahab, her husband, and the prophets of Bel, right? I'm sorry, long weekend. Um, threefold power is what Elijah the first had to deal with. He had to deal with an impure woman in an unlawful marriage to a king, and she was, under, she was guiding and directing the prophets of Baal. And what the prophets of Baal were doing was the dance of deception. They danced around the altar all day long, attempting to de- deceive in that final battle on Carmel. Ahab, a king, according to Daniel 2, a king represents a kingdom, a civil power, that was married to an impure woman, not supposed to be married to an impure woman. What's an impure woman? It's an impure church. So in the story of Elijah the first, we see that Elijah was dealing with threefold, threefold power that symbolized the combination of church and state at the end of the world with a deceiving power. Now Elijah the second, John the Baptist, he was dealing with threefold power. Herodias. An impure woman, married to a civil power, Herod. Were they supposed to be married? No, because Herodias was Herod's brother's wife. In fact, that's what got John the Baptist in trouble, right? And then we have Herodias' daughter. Now, who does Herodias represent? The papacy. But her daughter's involved with this story. Who's the daughters of the papacy? The Protestant churches. So the daughter of Herodias was Salome. What did Salome do? She did the dance of deception. Now, first, first Corinthians 10, 11 said, now all these things happened as an example of the end of the world. The end of the world. In Revelation 13, verses 12 through 14, we're told that the United States deceives the whole world. They are the ones that do the dance of deception. And right in the middle of that, in verse 13, in order to symbolize the deceptive work that the United States does, what, what, does John, what expression does John use to identify their their deception. They call fire down out of heaven. Where does that come from? That comes from the story of Elijah. I mean, if you want to tie the United States into the story of Elijah, it's verse 13 of Revelation 13. The United States is the false prophet, represented by the priest of Baal, prophets of Baal, and Salome. They do the dance of deception. Ahab, Herob, kings, they're a civil power that's in an unlawful relationship with an impure woman, Jezebel and Herodias. The Vatican. The United Nations, because Sister White and the Bible are clear, this is worldwide. We're talking about a one-world government. Brothers and sisters, there is no more time. We're at the end of the world. There's no more time for another organization to be raised up to compete 
with the United Nations to be the one world government. It's here and there. It's the only one there. It's a one world government. It, 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 Sister White it says every nation will be involved. It's a civil authority over the entire world. You can show this from Revelation 13, but in any case, uh, how many in Revelation 17, this civil power is represented by ten kings. Ten kings that receive one kingdom. One kingdom. Number ten, the number ten is associated with the dragon power. It's associated at least five times in scripture. Number ten. So this is one of them. I want to catch this in passing. Who is Ahab the king of? Who is the king of? He was the king of Israel, the northern kingdom. How many tribes are in the northern kingdom? Ten. Judah was the southern kingdom of two tribes. So one of the things that's associated with Ahab is the number ten, and we're saying that the dragon power and Ahab and Herod represent the United Nations. They're also representing the ten kings of Revelation 17, the ten toes of Daniel 2, uh, the ten tribes of Psalm 83, and the ten cities of Egypt in, I think it's Isaiah 30, 29 and 30. Five places in the scripture where number 10 is associated with this civil power at the end of the world. The impure wor church, of course, Vatican. False prophet, USA. There's a whole lot to say about this. Whole, I, I gave you a 10-minute presentation there on a, uh, at least an hour presentation, maybe a couple hour presentation, but we're setting something in place for where we're going and we're getting caught back up. Keep everybody comfortable. Um, there's more to say about this. We'll continue on with this theme as we proceed. But brothers and sisters, let me, I have two minutes. You associate the year 330 with this power. You show, associate the years 496 to 508 with this power. And you associate the year 533 with this power. Those histories have a direct relationship. 533 has a direct relationship with the United Nations. You can show it, and you'll see it. When we show it, you'll see it and say, yeah, I get it. Uh, you'll see 496 to 508 has a direct relationship to the United States at the end of the world. You'll see it. And of course, 330 is easy to see. The papacy is the one that gets seated upon the whole thing. So when the pioneers were dealing with prophecy in terms of pagan Rome and papal Rome and emphasizing the year 330, 533, 496 to 508, they weren't just being accurate with the message of Daniel and Revelation and with the historians. They were building the foundation to understand what's going on in the world today. That's what they were doing. Shall we pray? <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the work that was taken up by William Miller and his associates and uh, those that continued on after 1844 to hammer out these foundational truths in Adventism. And we ask that you would help each of us uh, come to a better understanding of these truths and how they relate to the end of the world. We've give it, you've given us a, a wonderful heritage in Adventism that, by and large, we know very little of because, as you pointed out in Revelation 10.4, these things have been sealed up to us. We ask that you continue the work of unsealing these things that uh, we can be part of placing the capstone on this work that is just as glorious as the foundation that you laid with um, the Millerite movement. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.